How are you, Booktube? My name is Maria, and welcome to my second wrap up of my books I read in July. Um, this is going to be a short one. It's only going to be three books and a movie. Um, so it's going to be um, Ernest Hemingway's Oh Man in the Sea, um, together with my Jane Austen reads. I wasn't going to do Jane Austen till I and I did it. Um, anyway. <laughs> you know <laughs> let's just divert off the tbr let's just divert off the tbr but while i was <laughs> on my holidays in sligo i had brought loads of books with me to read i think i had brought about eight maybe nine i might have brought nine of my tbr with me and of course the airbnb i was in had bookshelves and I encourage you to borrow books from their little library as well and they had some good stuff there that has the leaves um which is a book I actually read in Sligo which is why I went oh that's interesting to have House of Leaves I'd read it in Sligo last time I was there a few years ago um but while I was so while I was there you know loads of books for me I saw The Old Man in the Sea and I did pick it up and I read it it's a 1952 novella in case you don't know the copy I had was about 100 pages, so it's typically between 100 and 120 pages. It won the Pulitzer Prize. I only just found that out when I was um, just checking what I had read on my Goodreads there. Um, and it was mentioned in um, the the Nobel Award for um, Literature that was given to Ernest Hemingway as being a particularly important story. The story I loved it. Um, I remember seeing the All Black and White movie a long time ago and thinking this is the most boring thing and I will never, never, never read this book. And I read this book. Who knows? Who knew? Um, it is a compelling um, short novel. It is about a man who lives in Cuba, an old f fisherman. He has been something like 84 days without catching any fish. Um, and he happens upon after 84 days and being abandoned by the young man who usually helps him to who went to another vessel because he could, could live without fish you know you need to catch some fish so after 84 days this man comes upon the biggest marlin he's ever seen in his life and manages to catch it okay actually he catches it first then he realizes it's the biggest marlin that he's ever come across in his life and it's about his journey of trying to bring in this fish that is the full extent of this novel i mean there's backgrounds where um the old man is is um into baseball and talking about playing baseball with plantar fasciitis which is something i had a few years ago and how hard that would be um <laughs> and <laughs> at the same time he's doing this incredible he's in this teeny tiny vessel he's going out for days with this fish trying to get this fish and bring this fish in and the story is just basically a parable about wanting something desperately desperately and how far you're willing to go to get it something that you almost need you know and how far you'd be willing to go to get it and what would be the price if you did or you didn't get it um, and what's the worst possible outcomes and what's the best possible outcomes. Um, it's really hard to explain because it's so short a book that you really can't go on with about more than that. So, okay, on to the Jane Austen July, um, which I said I wasn't going to do. Then I said, okay, I'll just chuck in Pride and Prejudice because that's the one that I liked the best when I read. I read Jane Austen, I think I was about 60 and I read her complete works over a summer, all borrowed from the library. Um, with the exception of Persuasion, which is a book that they made us read when we were 17, 18 in school, um, which I hate, 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 hate it. Um, Pride and Prejudice has everything. Okay, I'm not even going to bother to do the synopsis of this because either you know this really well or you're not interested. <laughs> so, but Pride and Prejudice has um, still, to my mind, one of the most vivacious of um, Austen's heroines in um, Elizabeth um, Bennet. Um, she still strikes me as almost crazy. And I think Charlotte is the more sensible character in this. Now, as an adult, I'm saying, 
I wouldn't have said it when I was a teenager, but now Charlotte does the sensible thing and gets married well as soon as possible. They're living in Regency times. The only way women of the middle and the upper classes can get along is to secure a comfortable marriage. It's a, it's it's a, a lot. Uh, it's it's a, it's it's your livelihood as a woman in this period. Um, where Lizzie Bennet just takes all the risks, um, waiting for somebody who suits her. So she's almost, when you think about it, ridiculous, but she does it and she does it and chooses well. Now, <laughs> I always <laughs> say, remember when I was reading Persuasion, I do remember um, our English teacher, she was a very staunch feminist and she introduced me to a lot of feminist ideas and she's saying like she wished the Jane Austen's characters did not always marry for wealth they always do particularly in persuasion particularly in persuasion um so <laughs> unfortunately she always like unfortunately why did Mr Darcy have to be the richest one why could there not be another message um that's an interesting concept. The other thing that this teacher brought up was these books were set during the Napoleonic Wars and they're never mentioned. Now, considering how important um, the militia is in this book, um, the fact that the war itself is never spoken upon is, is an interesting point. It is never spoken upon. What well, Jane Austen does, which most people know, and I feel silly talking about this when there's such big fans out there, um, is the minutia of the relationships between the middle class and upper classes and the plight politics that they had amongst themselves at the time. She does obviously ignore us also the um the servants and the lower classes from this. Um so Absolutely, still am um, a five star read. It's still enjoyable. It's still one of the better written um, books. I um, romance books. Sorry, um, I think compared to Jane Eyre, which I came I went back to. I think I read the last two years ago. Was it? Um, which I'd also read as a teenager, probably a bit younger. Um, I found that Jane Austen was written for teenagers. She was um, overwritten and over too, <laughs> I, I'm not, not too fond of, of the person that she decided that, you know, with hindsight nowadays, don't think that she made a very good choice and um, the person that she desired the most, um, you know, <laughs> the very least he's a bigamist, you know. Um, Whereas I think that there is an awful lot more to um, and depth and on, and the unusualness in um, Jane Austen's um, characters. So putting that aside and starting to show the movie, when I what read these originally as a teenager, I there wasn't the BBC production with Conforth coming out the water. It didn't exist at that stage, okay? Because I'm old, so. The movie that uh, it's showing, I forgot to actually include the sound on it, so I just had to talk over it, um, is the one that I would have seen. It is the 1940 version. And the most important thing about the 1940 version of Pride and Prejudice movie is it is, in the, it is at the beginning of World War II. And they changed when it was set to 1830 so they could have more glamorous dresses which I thought was um, funny. Um, it is incredibly badly acted. It is, we look at it nowadays, I mean, Kira Knightley, far superior um, as an actress. But what it is, is um, better for some of the characters, caricatures, because again, it was the 1940s. It was in the middle of, uh, in the middle, the beginning of World War II. Um, and people needed cheering up. So Jane Austen has caricatures and, and com comedy and she has her um, incredible, incredible family in the Bennets um, with the over the top mother. Um, but 
in this one, they have given Mary a really good character role. She's actually quite, she's well over the top and I love her. <laughs> she's absolutely gorgeous in it. Um, and she has a different ending to the book. And Lady Catherine. Lady Catherine from this movie will always be Lady Catherine for me. She, she again has a different ending, different motives in the end um, to the original Lady Catherine. But by gosh, did I like her. Um, I thought she was charming where she's absolutely obnoxious in the book. So I just thought, mention the movie because I did grab and watch on to that movie. And then Longbourn. Um, Longbourn is a book that fills in some of the gaps that um, Jane Austen doesn't talk about. Um, it does talk about the Napoleonic Wars, the era it's set in. I mean, every, most, I mean, every man and his dog who loves Jane Austen and <laughs> has already um, read this. So I'm very, very late to the game. I actually got it when I first started watching Booktube. Um, so probably five, I don't know, I got it a long time ago, a long time ago. Um, it first came out and I just never got to read it because I never read, right? We read Pride and Prejudice and I wanted to read it first. So just in case you don't know, it's the servant story um, set along just before and just after and then all the way through the actual time period of Pride and Prejudice. And it takes it from their point of view. It's extremely well searched by jo Joe Barker in that um, it talks about the lifestyles of Regency servants. And I do think she kind of did a little bit too much telling a little bit in the book. Like, I mean, she was talking about um, dre dressing of um, Elizabeth Bennet and the under air harm. Um, I don't think a servant would notice under air harm, under arm hair um, in this period because they all had it too. It was normal. So there were just some things that she pointed at and went, they wouldn't even know it was that. That's normal. Um, but it does give, you know, the realities of like, you know, what was behind it. So it gave a real um, upstairs, downstairs feel to it. The reality of what's, what's, what was going on behind these scenes. Um, and I love the way that it embraced um, the, um, the Napoleonic Wars as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's foray into that. Um, Sarah from this story, very similar to Elizabeth Bennet, does ex goes far beyond what a servant or a person of the working class would have done in that time. Um, and for the same reason, I like Elizabeth Bennet, you know, pursuing her man. Um, I love the fact that Joe Barker let Sarah pursue her man too. Even under very dangerous circumstances, she's a far good to your woman because she needs to be. Um, so yeah, so that's, um, my wrap up number two for July. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I hope whatever you're reading that you're enjoying that too. And until next time, bye now.